Hello everyone and welcome to Revelway. My name is Savage Jalassi and in this video I'm going to be showing you how to create this burning paper effects. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you'll find this video informative and useful. Let's get started. So let's talk about what we're going to learn today and this is the effects preview again and the final result is done using Houdini 19 and Karma so we're going to cover that and uh, as you can see the effects is basically a uh, fire burning away paper, but it's not just uh, any fire. There's a lot of uh, interesting things happening here. So the first thing is the propagation effect. You can see we have a couple of places that starts off uh, burning and then that fire propagates. Now, it's not just a, a growing propagation. The parts that have burned or are eaten away, they're not going to burn again. So it's uh, it knows what has been eaten and what's remaining. And that's going to be done using a... Uh, a sub solver and the pyrospreads uh, tool to basically create this propagation uh, mask. That mask then we're going to isolate it and find the area where the fire is going to come from and use that to create the fire simulation. I'm not super happy with the final result but I will show you what tweaks needs to be done to make it look more interesting. Mainly what I don't like here is the amount of smoke and how it's affecting the uh, the fire behavior but overall as the uh, in terms of flames I think the flames are good we just need to reduce the smoke and that can be done uh, easily now this may look simple but actually it's quite complicated to get to get the paper uh, the geometry deforming as well as being used in other sims so there's like a, a recursive system that is changing the geometry but also that end result is being used in other processes. So the main effects that is quite complex here is the deformation of the paper. You can see as the fire pro uh, propagates, the remaining paper uh, ash-like is different. It has a different noise. It has a different texture. So we added this uh, complex cool effects uh, where the paper that's been not eaten away yet but about to get uh, burned out, it starts to crumble and deform and as you can see the edges of this paper are actually shrinking and so it, the effects is not limited to where the fire is we wanted to create the, that effect where if you have a, a thick paper that have maybe different materials like a layer of plastic and you go through a heating process and it starts burning that heat will actually deform the entire paper and and try to get it to shrink and crumble and that's the uh, complex part that's happening here. You can see that effect here. You can see the edges are being pulled, but there is nothing on them. There's no fire reached out to them yet. So, um, and then you can see it here happening quite well. And this deformation is actually going to be, again, the end result is always going to be used as a fire source. And layering all these effects together uh, needs to happen in specific orders. Otherwise, we won't get the uh, the final result and it won't look correct. So basically, we have this crumbling at the center where the fire has already gone through. And then we have other parts that have not been touched by fire, but they're also behaving uh, to that fire and reacting. So that's something we're going to cover. You can see the end result here is quite cool with all the crumbling and, and deformation. All right, so let me show a detailed list of what we're going to cover. So the burning paper using Houdini and Karma, I'm going to talk about the geometry preparation. I'll we'll start off with something simple. This is done using a Megascan uh, uh, asset uh, parchment paper that has an actual alpha mask that I use. I'm going to cover that and see how we can uh, create a simple paper, maybe just using noise. Uh, we're going to create the fire propagation. We're going to create the... A paper crumbling effect and that's the propagation of the fire and what's left behind it how the paper would look like after the fire burn, uh, burns it away uh, we're going to create the source for the fire and the fire itself and then we're going to create the karma scene and prep the layout lighting and shading so here i have two chairs uh, and uh, the statue here this is i believe from a place called polyhaven so free free stuff and then the mega scan uh this is only free if you use it with Unreal Engine, so you'd have to have an account to get this table, but there's other assets from Polyheaven that can be used to build something similar uh, if you're interested in creating that. Uh, we're also gonna look at using Glyph file format to import geometry and shaders 
into Houdini, how to work with Polyhaven, uh, Haven, and um, uh, import that into Karma. I'm going to talk about uh, rendering and compositing this in Nuke. And at the end, I'm going to show how to create a cool uh, cracking effect as the Baber burns away and potentially turn it into ashes. So we have uh, everything that gets burned away will basically fall as particles that we can use other uh, smoke sims uh, on them if we wanted to. But basically, I wanted to turn this into ashes. Uh, but the idea here is this paper is very thick, and so it's not going to just uh, fall. It's still There is still residue in it. And uh, there's one more effect here. You can see there's smoke coming from underneath the paper. It's not super realistic at the moment, but this is something you would get if uh, there's a lot of heat and there's a lot of wind happening. You would get this uh, second layer of smoke, white smoke from underneath the paper. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so let's get started and see how this is, can be done in Houdini. So let's take a look at the project. It's not very complicated, to be honest. And let me delete this. Okay, let's take a look at the first part, which is the paper. So this is what I have uh, as a starting point, And this is the geometry. And the way I created this geometry is by using Megascan uh, textures. And let me show that. So if you go to Megascan website and type in paper, you will find something like this. I believe this is the one. I, this is, has a lot of noises at the edges, but this is one of the textures and you would get, you won't get geometry, but you would get textures. And this is the texture example. So here I have the alpha or the opacity mask as this the this is the uh, diffuse texture the albedo which i multiplied with a an existing texture map from the witcher 3 so i multiplied it over this and that's the final final albedo texture that i used and then i have a displacement so all this would you would find in the uh, once you download the files and the displacement looks like this. Well, not so much, but yeah, you get the displacement information. So let's see how to import that. Well, actually before that, so you don't need uh, all of this. You don't need to use Megascan. You can still uh, Google uh, all paper alpha and use some of these like this one would give you a nice alpha this one you just have to mask it to get this nice edges and then it would just be a matter of creating uh, some noise maybe using just a mountain node like this and mask it so that it only happens at the edges so maybe something like this and lower the roughness Yeah, so we can easily create a, a nice deformation and fake all of this. We don't have to use the textures if you don't have mega skin. Uh, so, okay, I applied the, uh, the opacity. Let's dive inside. So a uh, color map with a UV texture. Uh, first of all, I created a grid, sorry, and then a texture, just a UV texture node promoted that into a point attribute. Here, it's not gonna matter because I needed its points and it's just a flat plane, so it's gonna be fine. And then I used that UV texture to read in the opacity and also the displacement. So the displacement information is being used to push the, uh, let me do this. I'm gonna disconnect it. This has the displacement map, I'm gonna delete it. And let me show you how it's done. So color map node. And this is the map and the UV coordinate. So vector to float because the UV is two. You can use a vector to float three, that's fine. And then the X would go to the U and the Y would go to the V. And let's take a look at this in as colors. This node is locked, so let me unlock it. So the disk map is, is not connected properly. And let me do that. Yeah, so the, now the displacement map is being visualized. I just copied the path and pasted here. 
so this okay so i'm going to use this black and white information let me display this flat shade i'm going to use this black and white information to offset the y position so set vector component and this is the uh, vector i want to change one of its values i'm going to change the y coordinate and this is the result i want to use the displacement and if i connect this to p now you see that all the paper has moved up and we got all this information so all we have to do now is delete everything else outside the uh, the mask and i'm using a very high resolution uh, mesh so it's 1 million points and it's 1000 by 1000 i think it's very high but you can lower it if it if you find it slow so blast delete anything that is not black that is black sorry and then i uh, can use a uv quick shade node to display the texture and this is the result i have in the viewport cool so i then wanted to add extra deformation i felt the paper is quite flat and i didn't want that i want to make it feel thicker and heavier that where it can stand on its center and everything else is uh, bent or deformed and not on on the surface and the reason I did this is that I just wanted to have more gaps so when I deform the geometry it has space to go because it's if it's super flat and we deform it then it has to go up and it's not going to look great so this way it's going to be simpler so what I did is I put a bend node let me show how to do that so here is a bend node and I just want to make this more concave so let's say we're going to bend it this way and I'm going to copy the same node and do it in the other uh, direction so the capture uh, direction minus one and I'm going to lower it and then another bent let's do this here another bend node pointing in the x direction and let's increase the capture region and move this. I just want to affect the segment from the, the page, from the paper, sorry. And I'm going to bend it up like that. And if we wanted to hit one corner, I'm going to copy this one more time. And just, this is up, let's scroll down. So let's see. Yeah, minus one. And then this one is minus one as well. And let's lower the value. I just want to move it to this corner. Something like this. And I'm going to lower the uh, capture region. And we can either go down or up. Let's increase the capture. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, we can get some nice deformation on this so it's not super flat. And that's what I've done here. Not as much as the example we did. All right, so I think that's pretty much it for the pepper, uh, paper geometry preparation. We're gonna start talking about the uh, uh, the fire spread source and how to use the pyro source spread uh, node in Houdini. Next on the list is the fire propagation or fire spread. So let me show that. This is the final result of the fire propagation, and we're basically selecting and telling it this is this place is super hot. It's gonna start burning. And then the fire starts propagating from that. So this is the final result from the source. We can also create various masks. Uh, for example, we can isolate the edge. We can create uh, something like this. And that's what we use to make the color of the burn. Let's change it. And we can make another color here. So that part is super bright. And 
and this plate. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm gonna create a copy of this grid and let's lower the resolution to 200 so it's faster to work with. And let me make sure everything is hidden. What's happening? Okay, and let's create a group node. And I'm gonna group a couple of points. Just a couple of points at one of the corners. And I'm gonna create a wrangle node. And I'm gonna create the spread node, pyro spread source. And this node, what is, uh, this node is looking for is basically a temperature or a burn uh, field. So I'm going to create a temperature field, a temperature value, and I'm going to set it to 10. And this only is going to be true for the points that we just selected. Why is this not working? Oh, attribute. Yeah, it is correct. Why is this not working? Let's see. Oh, cooking was interrupted. Yeah, this happens a lot. So when I hit, when uh, Houdini is calculating something and I hit escape, sometimes it doesn't like that. Yeah, I think now it's back, okay. So uh, group two, that's the points, and those points have a value of 10, everything else has a value of zero. So let's create a color node. And let's use the visualize mode. So I'm gonna visualize temperature, and you can see the areas that we just uh, set value to 10 has different color. And if I hit play, it's not, not much is happening right now. So let's create a color node and let's visualize the temperature. After the solve, gonna hide this. And let's hit play, no propagation happening. Let's lower the cooling rate and increase the search radius because maybe we don't have enough points. And if I hit play now, you can see the fire or the temperature is still, it's propagating nicely, which is pretty cool. So because the geometry may not have enough points, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a scatter nodes, scatter node, and just increase this to 10,000, maybe 100,000, and fill this geometry with lots of points. And now we're gonna group, let's group by a bounding box and just group one corner like we did. And let's go back to the first frame. Now if I hit play, you can see the propagation is happening. So we have uh, simple options here. Let's increase the search radius and the max neighbor so it, the point can look up further and finds more point easily. And I'm gonna add uh, a noise to this. Well, there is noise right now, so I'm gonna just lower the scale to 0.2 and let's hit play. You can see the noise pattern is, is different. And let's increase the search radius at uh, the rate to five. Yeah, see now it's moving faster. And let's increase the search radius and set this to 10 and this to 0.6. So let's hit play and see. Yeah, it's working. So we can, what we can do is we can uh, copy this node again and create another source here. And let's, so and, uh, when I copy this node, I'm gonna set, instead of initial merge replace, I'm going to say union uh, with existing. So if I hit play, they're both propagating and meeting at the center. 
and that's our source. So uh, we can use the temperature as a mask to isolate the edge and that's the part we're going to use to emit fire from. So the fire source is going to be only the edge and then the, uh, the remaining masks we're going to use to basically transition to other geometries or the deformed geometry. So once the a mask is gone, once the plate, the, the spread happens, everything else behind it is going to become black. And we can always lower this to get nice gradients. Maybe this 2.5. And I will show it in here. So the next uh, tricky part so the next tricky part is to uh, create this source dynamically because right now we just selected two and the simplest way to do that is by uh, scattering one point at the geometry. So I'm going to scatter one point and I'm going to change it every frame. Okay, so it changes every 10 frames. And if I look at that point, scattering on the geometry, one time it's there. Let's see. So that's one. Every 10 frames, it changes. And uh, I'm going to add a, a piece care randomization. So it's different every frame. And then I'm going to copy a box. So you can see the box is now jumping every 10 frames. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that to group points on the paper, which I've scattered. So I've scattered. 100,000 points and now with the group we're going to say you're now your temperature value has five next is this after that another point so it's going to be jumping from one place to the other igniting every time uh, it touches that and then this is the same so I'm setting the temperature to five and this is the pyro source and let's take a look at the settings so the cooling rate is much lower, so we want the fire to stay longer. Uh, the search rate radius is smaller because we have more points, and the maximum number is 70. It, it's fine, like it's not going to have a big effect as long as it's above 50. And then I have some noise here, and then also uh, noise on the fuel, but we're not using the fuel at the moment, so we're simply using the temperature. And this is the source. All right, so all of this was done on a scatter on different points. It has nothing to do with the geometry. Well, it is related to the geometry, but this data that we have is not on the geometry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an attribute transfer and transfer temperature and burn to the geometry. And burn is basically one and zero. It's has it been burned yet or no? So it's a, a black and white value. And then the temperature has more decay. It has the, uh, it cools over time and it has a nice gradient that we can use to create these, these types of masks. All right, so that uh, is transferred to the geometry and then I cache it out to save disk, to save uh, sim time. And the data is here. The next effects that we're going to talk about is the heat distortion and this is where we see the paper uh, getting distorted and deforming before the fire reaches uh, that part. So that's the thing uh, we're going to try to implement now. And this is a very, very simple idea and the way we're going to do it is, let me try and draw something and I think it will help uh, explain this. So. I only have a mice, so sorry about the drawing. But let's say this is the paper. And we have a couple of points here. Let's say we have one point here, one point here, and here, and here. And the burning source is like this. So this is all burning and super hot. So what we want to do is we want to affect the edges or pretty much everything that is not this. And we want these points to move towards where there is fire. So what we need to do is we need to tell this point where is the lo nearest location that is burning. 
and once we find that uh, uh, that location we can compute the vector this vector will give us a direction so we have one point that is not burning second point it's burning this is not burning and let's say we uh, were able to figure out what point is that you can create a vector and use that vector to push this point closer to this point if we do this over time every time just one tenth uh, uh, one tenth of a unit we can slowly push the points uh, towards the nearest burning place and uh, uh, because the fire is changing this direction and this vector is going to also change so let's say the next frame the fire propagation is only happening here all these points will be looking at this but if we have other resources as well available these points they'd have to figure out what is the closest point to them and use that to decide where to go and that's the idea but we're not going to do it uh, just one time we're going to accumulate it over time so every frame we're going to take this force and apply just a little bit and that new mesh is now different because let's say we have four points right we transform them using uh, we push them towards this field and now those four points are maybe like this they are just smaller so this new position is what we need to use to do the new lookup so this result uh, in in a solving basically and that's and that can be done using a stop solver so we're going to take a result uh, we're going to take data process that data and then the end result is going to go back to that loop and be used again in that system and that's what the SOLP solver is going to allow us to do so uh, what I'm going to show is the how we can figure out the the closest uh, points to create this vector from and what I have here is let me create a what I have here is the burning edge so I've created a mask and separated that and we'll go back to this burning edge in a second but let me just time shift this and freeze it freeze both of them and this is the all the points I'm gonna create a point vop and this is my data this is the points I want to change and this is my source okay it's static right now and that's fine so let's dive inside we're gonna use a node called XYZ distance and this node allows us to do a lookup to find from an existing point where is the closest point from a second mesh uh, like an attribute transfer or a point cloud lookup but this is simpler so we're going to use the second input and it's going to give us a primitive and a primitive uv so we're going to do a primitive uv lookup and it also returns a distance so let's take a look at the distance value and you can see it's black and white mask so the closest points are going to be black because the distance is shorter and this point is too far from this so that's white and we can uh, change this we can use a fit range and say my distance is 0 to 5 and I want to invert that range so only the places that are close are going to be white maybe let's lower this let's lower it even more so you can see now we have points they are aware of where that data is and this is the points that we're talking about here and I haven't imported data from the second input at all and that's not the plan here but basically we want this uh, this mask so in order for this mask to work nicely I, I want it to reach all the way so let's say 0 to 5 and you can see we have nice uh, gradient now and uh, the next thing is I'm gonna use I'm gonna import the point position from the second input so okay we have the distance we want to find where uh, what point are we dealing with I'm gonna use a primitive attribute node and it's called a prim uv and the uv coordinate are the prim uv the primitive number is this and the input is this and we want to import the p position and if I just connect this here we will get all the points to snap to that there's an OpenGL uh, issue here but 
all the points you can see they're snapped right away to the closest one. And I'm going to multiply this by that distance. And let's connect it. Not so much happening. So what we're going to do is we have the point position. So this is the point and we have those points here. Each point now knows the closest one. And I'm going to create a subtract node. And I'm going to subtract the point position from the nearest point on that mesh. I'm going to connect this to N and let's visualize the, the normals. You can see they're all pointing towards this direction. You can see all of them, they're taking us this way. And if I add this information now, if we created this vector, if we add this information to the existing point, we're going to simply shift everything. So let's disconnect the N and the C. And you see how everything moved. So let's add a multiply by constant. You can see how everything is moving. But right now it's moving away. So I'm going to invert the subtraction. And you can see as I play with this, we're moving the points more and more towards the distance. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is instead of using uh, just a uniform value or this result, I'm going to normalize it. it. So I only get the direction. I don't need this vector to have a magnitude. Now the result is uniform. So regardless of where the point is, we're going to be moving everything at the same distance. And I'm going to use this mask as a multiplier to change how this is working. So I can make the points that are closer move faster and vice versa. So see now we it's only see how it's pulling. It's not the same anymore. But we don't want to pull the closest more. We want to pull the furthest more. So I'm going to inverse this mask. And now if I multiply, you can see the furthest point are uh, getting coming in closer and this is more the type of the effects I want to create. You can see it here. I don't care too much about distorting this because I really want to pull the far away things rather than the super close things. Again, everything is going to move, so uh, that should be fine, uh, but I want to change the value. So what we're doing right now is moving. This pattern is very interesting. I do like this pattern. So let me put just an exploration thing. Because that's Houdini. See, I want to delete. Yeah, this is this pattern is very cool. I think I think there's some potential to create some cool uh, abstract art with this, maybe some uh, deformation. Oh, it's only that. I think we can do a polyline. Yeah, there's definitely potential. Maybe you guys can try something. I like the pattern. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to disable the time on this node and keep my geometry static. So the only thing that's changing is this. And let's see how that's going to look on the geometry. You see, as I play through, because that data is changing every time, we're getting this snapping effect. And that's not what we want. So the way I wanted to do is, once I deform the geometry, this, uh, this frame, that's what I want to use in the next frame. And then the frame after is going to have the accumulation of all of that. And that's where the sub solver is going to come in. I'm going to create a solver node. And I'm going to copy a node from the existing graph. And I'll explain this in a second. And let me connect this. And let's copy this one. And this is my uh, second input. 
this is my first input. And again, I'm going to keep the, the geometry static. And let's dive inside. And let's go back. Actually, I'm going to have both of them static to make sure that we have data to work with. Okay. So this is my geometry. This is my points. Where's the points? I believe they should be here. Okay. And let's go. This is my geometry. I'm going to plug it here. And so what this node, a switch node is doing is basically at the first frame, we don't have a preview result. So what we do is we simply use a copy of the first geometry input. And then after the first first frame using this expression, it's just going to switch. So if I play through, see it's going to use the previous frame because that's going to have data now. So let's go back up. And now we have this static. Maybe we'll use frame 20 so it's simpler. And again, the geometry now is not moving. Only this data is changing. So let's see how this is going to play now. And as you can see, it's no longer snapping. The geometry is no longer snapping, but we're moving it too fast. Let, let's disable this and let's play. Let's play it now. Yeah, it's, it's too much. The distortion is too much. So instead of applying this much, see a trunk right away, instead of applying that much force, we're just going to go to this multiply node here and reduce this to something really low. So every frame would just add a fraction of that so we don't move the points super, super fast. Let's go back up, reset the sol solver and hit play. And now it's moving much better. So let's uh, disable the time offset and hit play. And I'm sure why it's moving. Oh, I think I know why, because there's a time offset. So let's start this at frame seven and I'll explain this in the next video because I don't have frames until, uh, I don't have data until frame seven. So if we hit play now, you can see that all the entire paper is moving towards whatever source uh, there is. Actually, let's display that maybe. Yeah, so that that's the points. You can see once another source pops in, it will take away those points and start moving them towards this source. And basically everything is uh, just nicely distributed. Well, not, not so nicely, but nice enough. Yeah, you can see we're getting this split. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, smooth this result as much as I can. And actually, I wish I didn't have this much geometry because it's quite slow and I don't need that much accuracy for this FX. So let's do a smooth. And let's lower the quality. Set it to 20. And let's go back up. And we can use other masks as well to uh, help with this. Like if we wanted to change anything based on the uh, uh, based on the burn, so maybe nothing that is being burned moves, and only things that haven't burned yet. So we use the inverse of the white mask. Maybe this is gonna leave the center areas or the areas that are burned to be unaffected, and only affect the areas, the other places. And look now with the with that smooth, we're not getting that sharp. Uh, a split anymore. The result is being nicely distributed and this is very, very cool. All right. The last thing I added is uh, because I wanted to randomize this a bit, I added a noise to the, uh, to the geometry, to the burning edge. So instead of it being flat like this, I just added this noise and that's just going to make the, uh, break up the result a bit more. So this is the final final geometry and I think I wish I did add more smooth because I'm getting yeah it's 
can be better. So this is the final result. And so um, one thing I, I really can't explain this nicely without showing it without going through the example, but having all these deformation being layered and being used with various solvers is quite tricky because what do you do first? Which one do you do first? Do you do the crumbling of the paper first or do you do the UV distortion first or do you do, I mean, it's clear that we need the fire propagation, but what I found is it's best to do the distortion first and then the crumbling uh, of the paper. So that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna blend this to have, so that anything that hasn't burned yet is gonna have this uh, uh, nice look and it's gonna have the UV distortion happening Anything that has burned is going to have this crumbly uh, black look with, with lots of noise uh, in it. All right, so we've created the uh, UV distortion trick. You can see the geometry is pulling. And this is pretty much all I need uh, for to illustrate this effect. We are still going to add a few more things to this. Now, I've cast the propagation, uh, the spread in this geometry, and I also added a time offset. So the time shift simply adds a seven frame gap so that the first frame is doesn't have anything and then only after frame seven, we start seeing uh, this. Now, uh, with this point, Bob, I'm simply reading the data from uh, seven frames earlier or after, and I'm also taking the temperature, remapping it, and exporting it as a burn etch, and that's what we're seeing here. So the burn edge is going to simply isolate this and it's basically this. So temperature and I'm going to isolate it, let's find, yep. So it's basically that. That's the burn edge and I'm creating it as a separate attribute. So it's, it's not exactly there, maybe here. And I need more VMAP. Yeah, so that's the burn edge. And then we have our UV distortion, UV distorted mesh. And again, this can be any mesh. It does not have to be the same exact one as the paper. And uh, what I've done is I used a point deform to apply that nice deformation to the geometry. So this is the paper, this is the deformed paper, and I use a point deform. And now that same deformation is somewhat happening to the mesh and I have more freedom now to even interpolate uh, using this. So I can, I can increase the point radius. Again, I have lots of points. So it may not, the result may not show here. Set it to 0.3. Yeah, it's, it's changing a bit, but again, we have lots of points and they're identical. So the result is, uh, it's very close. And now we have our geometry with the texture and we can visual, visualize the texture here. And I think with the smooth uh, UV attribute uh, 20 and one, we can uh, fix all these or at least make it much better. The next thing we want to add is the uh, real deformation to the paper being burned away. So what I've done is I created uh, two states, a deformed state using a mountain node, doesn't do much here, a mountain node, a point bop, and a another mountain node. And then I separated the the second area where the fire is. So any anywhere where there's temperature higher than 0.2, this is gonna be uh, uh, deform area one, and this is deform area zero. And then I transfer that attribute to create a, another mask. So if I create a color here, and I'm gonna show what that means. So I'm gonna set this to red and this to black. And I simply want to create a mask that I don't have. So transfer, transfer to from CD. 
and this is black I'm gonna lower the radius and we can get uh, basically another mask that goes beyond the region and this can allow me to do more things so that's uh, that's the idea between separating the two is to create this mask and I use the value 109 and then I'm going to uh, use that mask to blend between the distorted mesh to blend between the distorted mesh and the rest position and you know what let's create this from scratch so let's create a point bob and we need this uh, color information so let's lower it to something like this and we have all the data here so this is the current position and i stored the rest position in this value what this means is basically i'm going to store a copy of the point position so let's dive inside let's create a, a bind node import the rest attribute which is a point position and i'm going to mix between the current position which is the deformed state the original position which is the undeformed state and use the the red channel so vector to float we use the red channel as the mix and then connect this here. Now we, we have the inverse, so let's connect the first one to be the rest. The second one is the new position. And let's set the color to white. And now we have this. So anywhere the fire has gone through, we are getting this leftover state where the paper is super deformed. And again, we are still maintaining all that nice distortion because it's coming through the original mesh. There's one more thing I added, which is very, very similar. So I isolated the geometry again, and I uh, created deform area B. I blurred the result. Uh, what is this fade? So this is just a copy of the temperature and I wanted to blur that just to get a nice spread. And then I transferred again, same trick from this to this. And I used this new mask to add another noise explicitly on this area. So see anywhere there's super hot fire, it's gonna affect beyond and behind just uh, around that edge, just around the rim of the geometry we're getting this edge and now we're using that as another mask and this is going to add to the realism maybe it's not very visible here i think because of the texture but areas that are after the fire they are also being moved and then area behind it they are also being affected and then everything else the center when it fully uh, crumbles and i think maybe we can go a bit higher with this one and that's it. That's really it for the uh, for the paper deformation. And this is the final result. And Houdini crashed, so let me reopen it again. Hey, I'm gonna do a preview of the paper. Let's do it together. And yeah, you can see the distortion of the paper being pulled in. And then the uh, the deformation happening as the fire progresses. Now there's one more element that I don't have in the render. I had it before, but I I lost it for some reason because I was doing some uh, tweaks. Let me see if I can find it. So this is an early test. Yeah, I had it here. I think I'll I'll do another render uh, with this. So you can see uh, this edge here that is brighter than everything else i don't have it in this one and we definitely should have that so i want to bring it back in we see like a super bright yellow uh, line progressing so let's see it's not here but we can easily add that so um, after the result i'm going to use a color node and just take the temperature uh, or the burn edge attribute that we created and color it to be to have a yellow to red 
uh, value and then we just add it back to the color and let's texture this with the uh, with the actual texture and I think this adds quite a bit to the result and we'll show how to render that as well so yeah This is an early test and with the we're going to start looking at the fire this is also an early test with the fire maybe i can find another clip yeah i do have two more previews let me find them so this is another version of the paper okay so this is another early version of the paper you can see i have lots of uv distortion so just too much happening here and the fire is too, the scale of the fire is not realistic. And actually, in some cases, you would want more details. In some other cases, you would want less details. So that's what I ended up doing, is tweaking it so I don't have as much details. And let me see, I have another test. Uh, this is another version with that yellow edge included and just started building the, the scene with the table and all. So that's the, that's the edge I wanna bring back. And this is our preview result. And I think it's pretty cool. So the next thing we're going to do is create the fire uh, source. And we're gonna do that by isolating the hottest area. And we can check this by checking the temperature if it's uh, less or equal than 0.1 and higher than one, we are going to isolate it. So that's the expression uh, to use here. And then I'm gonna use that geometry to scatter points on it and then map the temperature to go into temperature. I really don't have to do this. I think the default value is fine. So we're just making uh, the points brighter and we could just say temperature equal one. That would still be the same and then a uh, density attribute with some noise. So just attribute noise and create a, an attribute called density. It's not a vector, it should be a float like that. And then we rasterize this using volume rasterize attribute and I only need density and temperature. So that's it, very, very simple. And because the fire is gonna most likely go up, 99% of the time is gonna go up. I didn't add a collision geometry here because I know it's there'll be, uh, there won't be much smoke left to collide with the paper with. Okay, next thing is the DOP network. And it's very simple. So I have the uh, source to import uh, the fire source. I have a pyro solver and I have a gas uh, damp node to basically drag, apply a drag to the entire sim, and it's only dragging uh, by a value of 0.1, so like 10% every frame just to make it uh, calmer. So the settings uh, doesn't really matter that much. Uh, we don't need a lot of turbulence, a lot of disturbance. We don't need most of this. We just need some dissipation and turbulence. And here the turbulence is happening to the uh, temperature, not the density. Sorry, the density, not temperature, because the default is temperature. We always want to disturb that, and that was not working because uh, we don't want too much details. I know this sounds weird, but we don't need too much details. This actually had a lot of details, I think. No, this is the same version, but this is an early version where I had a lot of details, and I needed to find a way to uh, reduce that. So the way to do that is by adding a large scale. Uh, noise to get just the flame to move, you know, and get stretched. And then the trick is to diffuse the uh, temperature diffusion. So we want to blur the temperature every frame to get those stretchy, elongated uh, paper-like flames, like these, to represent small-scale fire. And I think that's really it. There's not much else happening. I then catch the fire. So this is the source. And like I was saying, what I don't like the most in uh, my render, or at least the first thing I want to fix, is that amount of smoke. I think it's too much. And I think the fire, 
spread uh, goes up too high. So what I can do is to tweak that, go back in the solver, reduce the flame 0.1 and also turn off. I don't need any emit smoke. I don't need any emit temperature. It's going to be just fine. If we need more temperature, we can increase it here to two, but that should uh, lower the flame height and reduce the amount of smoke. And the reason I want to do the smoke in sim is because they are interconnected. So if we have density, it's going to affect the uh, the temperature and they they both work together. So it's not like hiding uh, the smoke. Let's do, uh, let's copy this. All right, let's create a pyro bake node. And I'm going to go to the fire, turn it on, and this is displaying our uh, temperature uh, field. I'm going to set it to 50. And I'm going to lower the smoke density to 0.1. You can see we already have a lot of fire, and that's the stuff I was talking about. Like if we hide the smoke, it's not going to just fix the problem that we're having. Uh, we can also create a mask based on height. So let's set this to two, maybe five. Yeah, something like that, eight. And just because I like you guys, I'm going to create this mask based on height for the temperature. So I'm going to create a, a volume VOP. Let's create a bind node, create a temp uh, bind the temperature, and then bind export the temperature again. I'm going to use a vector to float, get the Y position, use a fit range to remap it, use a ramp node because we want more control, obviously. And I hate this, but the float ramp only comes empty. I don't like that. So let's export this and let's make sure we multiply our result with the temperature. And let's export the min and max. And let's find the balance. So I think let's go down. What is the range? So the max is four and the min is 0.1. So min, let's inverse it. Hmm, let me see, maybe I picked a different, yes, yeah, the Y position. Let's just connect this here. And tweak it so that we get the nice gradient from here. Okay. So like that, but we need to inverse it. So I'm going to use, set this to one and this to zero. And let's connect this here. And now it should work. Yep. And you can see the smoke is uh, still there. So I'm going to just hide it completely. You can do the same thing to dissipate it. Okay, and let's play with the ramp. And let's do this. Instead of using the current point position, see now the flames, maybe let's just flatten them so we have more data to look at. So what I can do is I can create a noise. Let's go with a turbulent noise and add this noise as a as a vector to the current point position. And that's just gonna, that's just gonna offset the, uh, uh, the Y axis. So let's set this to 10 and this to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. This is to two. Let's increase the frequency. Yeah, you can see it there. So now we're getting more uh, breakups and this is great. Yeah, I don't think we need that much fire, but again, this would have the smoke be different. So maybe it's just a matter of rendering this, uh, 
Maybe it's just a matter of rendering this as the temperature and let's let's go even more crazy. Let's do this. Let's create our own uh, density field. <clears throat> Pardon me. So I'm going to isolate the temperature. Right. So that's my temperature field. I'm going to name it to from I'm going to rename it from temperature to density. Let's see. So name temperature now density. Okay. I'm going to remove the original density. I don't need it here because we're going to replace it with our own. So maybe the temperature is only is the maybe the density is the original temperature field that it is elongated and then the new actual temp is the new masked one that's the idea uh, so let's delete the density here now we have the <clears throat> we have a remap temperature and i'm going to merge this here and now if we look we should see that's our old temperature but used as uh, as density now I like this. I think this can work. Okay, so the other uh, cool features from the bake is the uh, the scatter, which is quite cool. So you can see we're getting this nice glow in here, and it's going to create a scatter fields. So we can build this or connect it into the temperature. Just use that, and let's just do a preview. I think we are good. Too much fire flat shaded so we don't see the bounding box and let's do uh, let's increase the resolution to 1024 and let's tweak the settings so that we can see the full volume let me find this data because they keep changing it texture limit texture HDR textures full uh, HDR texture is full HDR and then there's another one I believe under scene yeah to enable this okay let's go back and forth and now we're displaying the volume at its full resolution let's uh, do a capture now and I'll resume in a second let's see how this is going to look like so the preview is done and I'm pretty happy with the result. I definitely like the amount of smoke better and the color as well. And the fire is, uh, feels more natural now. This one uh, that I did, I'm not super happy with the uh, with this smoke, but the fire is, is good. So I think combination of both would definitely uh, be ideal. So this is the original version that I showed in the beginning and what we have been working on. And together we've made a couple of adjustments that I really liked and decided to re-render uh, the two shots that we have. And so the main tweaks or the main thing that was bothering me is the amount of smoke and how long the fire is. We've made the post process uh, together to basically uh, limit the fire and use the original temperature as the density. And I also was missing the edge of uh, the flame. So the edge of spreading in the shader and I've decided to bring that back. So what I've done is Oh, one more thing. I also uh, saved out a new cache of the paper with a smooth value of 20 and quality of 2. Uh, this one has, I think, lots of stretching. The new one, one has less stretching. So I have took the, the file, everything we did together. So the this is using the live file that we made. And here inside the subsolver, the quality is higher in the smooth. So 10 and 2. And then I also uh, did the tweak to the fire. So this is what we did together using the height. And then I wrote out a new cache for the, uh, for the smoke as well as the geometry. So for the geometry, this is the old one. And this is the new one. So let me... Move it to the side. So this is the new one. You can see the fire now 
does not go uh, that high and there's not so much smoke. And again, the density field here is a copy of the original temperature. So that in the previous was mainly temperature. And now with, with the new one, I think it works much better with the edge as well. Everything looks much cleaner and the uh, there's not so much distortion on the UVs because the smooth quality is much better. So yeah, I re-rendered the shot and this is another uh, camera angle from the top panning and I have lots of depth of field going on. All right, let's see. So I think that's really it for uh, for the tweaks and I showed you how uh, the new renders look and we're gonna talk about uh, rendering in the next few videos. So what I wanna show in this one is actually trying to create, taking a risky move here trying to recreate something like this and uh, the geometry for the uh, for the paper. So we have basically details and noise around the, the edges, a little bit of noise around uh, in the center, and then we have this nice bump across the board that actually shows up quite well. And I do like it. I don't know about you guys, but this wrinkly feels like it makes the paper feel that it's thick and it has been wet before and then it dried so you get this wrinkly uh, texture at the top so that's uh, coming from the geometry and the swap solver so let's try let's see i'm gonna create a grid and i want to make it the same size of the uh, of this paper so let's just approximate that and again i am gonna do it live, show some ideas, and maybe you guys can explore this more. And let's create a texture node. And set it to point mode. And what I'm trying to do is basically isolate or create a mask that fades away from various angles. We can do it in many ways. We can create a, a, a line around this and transfer the color and get a nice mask. Or we can use the UV and that's what I'm gonna do. So let's connect this here and let's increase this to 256, 256. Let's move the plane and round these numbers. And let's dive inside. So we need the UVs vector to float. I'm going to take the uh, X and plug it through a ramp. And let's take a look at that. I'm going to hide the colors. So this should look white. Oh, sorry, UV. Okay. So let's uh, isolate the top and bottom. And that's going to be white. And same thing here. And make this color white. And let's do the same thing for let's call this ramp uh, u sorry ramp u and it resets itself terrible and ramp v and let's use uh, red and green to visualize this so float to vector and i'm going to take the red and the green and let's do this again and there's a trick here. If you show the color, oh, something is happening with Houdini and Open Color IO. So let me restart and we're, uh, we'll resume in a second. Okay, so we're back and I think it's going to crash again. I've noticed this when I move the viewport edge or rescale it, uh, Houdini crashes. I think maybe fixed in the new one. I'm using the 3A3 which was released three weeks ago, there's a new one. So the trick is you can visualize a red, green, and blue in the viewport. So if you have colors, you can isolate that without having to do uh, anything. Okay, let's create the mask again. So that's the red. And let's take a look at the green. Okay, white. Okay, 
and let's uh, dive inside and use this as a mask to create a noise. So I'm going to create a turbulent noise and just add it to the point position and see how that's going to look first. And then we decide what to do with it. And I don't need the colors. And this needs to be a 3D. I'm going to change it to zero centered noise. I'm going to increase the frequency to 4, 4, and 4, and lower the amplitude. So that's one. And actually, I want to separate the two. So I want the left side separate from the red side. Uh, sorry, the left side separate from the right and top separate from the bottom. So this one, I'm going to set this color to red and this to green. Or let's set it to blue. Okay. And now I can use vector to float and vector to float, and I can multiply this result with that mask. Okay. And then let's add this to the point position. Actually, let's multiply the noise and let's add that to this. So we're just distorting this area. Okay, so I think the height, the push and pull is too much, which is happening on the X and Y. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the vector to float here and then float to vector. And let's move this here. And I'm going to create a multiply by constant for each one. So Y, X, and Z. And now we will have control over how much influence. So I don't like the, uh, the side to side, which is the Z. I'm going to set this to 0 0.2 and see how it's moving back because I, I don't want to distort that and then the up and down maybe you can go a bit more not too much let's just leave it at one and here 2.5 cool so that's one one thing uh, one effects I'm gonna copy the same thing and instead of multiplying it by the red I'm gonna multiply it by the blue so this second noise by the blue and let's add it and I'm going to change the noise to be stri simplex and now we should see it here by the way oh let's see okay that's the first one so we were looking like this and this is the second one Pardon me. Two, I'm going to make the noise bigger here. And I want to make it uh, go further. So let's drag this blue in. Okay. And the same idea is going to apply for the sides as well. So let's copy this vector to float. And let's see what colors we have. I'm going to use the uh, the red same thing sorry red and blue and i'm gonna copy this okay and one is gonna be the red and the other one is gonna be the blue here and all of this is going to get added together and you will see how the sides are going to be uh, deformed now so this one side and this one side again I'm sure there's other ways to do this effects but I just wanted to show 
what Houdini uh, can do. So let's pick a different noise here. And let's lower the frequency on something big. See that line there? I want to fix it. So instead of uh, linear, I'm going to change it to, let's see, let's try busier. Yeah, maybe we'll just smooth it out later. It's a bit tricky with just colors. Okay, I do like the noise though. So let's keep, uh, let's use the same one here and let's lower the frequency as well. And the amplitude, and I wanna make it tighter on this side. Okay, let's add another noise to uh, everything. And let's use, let's see, I want to make the noise uh, only appear in the center. So let's copy this. Let's call it center. And let's copy this and call it center. And I'm going to add both of them and I will show how that's going to look like as colors. Okay. And what I'm going to do is move this here, move this here. And same thing. And we'll smooth it out and add some noise. And let's use that as a multiplier for a another noise. Let's pick let's pick a turbulent noise. Again. It's fine. Connect this to position, multiply it by this new mask. And let's add it. And it needs to be a 3D noise. And frequency is going to be much lower and amplitude as well. That's very cool. Okay. And let's add one more using the mountain node and uh, reduce the roughness to get something like this and the amplitude as well. Okay, and then we can use the bend node to add uh, some interesting deformation. I'm just going to copy this from the previous example. See there, this one, and this one. We can also do specific uh, bends. So let's copy using a soft deformer. Let's say we want to twist one corner. Let's do it here so everything stays the same. And I'm going to select all the points or some of them from this side. It's probably better to use a grid, uh, sorry, a group node and do this. But let's do it this way. I'm going to use a soft deformer and move this up and rotate it. And it is too much, so this is what I do. I'm going to put down a blend shape node, connect this here, the original one in the second input, and now I can tweak that amount. And let's add the noise back in. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's not exactly the same, but I think we have some cool uh, details. And let's add that last bump as well using a mount node a mountain node and let's increase uh, lower the element size and let's 
lower the amplitude and lower the roughness yeah something like that all right i think we have a very cool paper now let's take a look at this with the uh with the current texture okay and let's get it because the uv is different and the texture was based off of that let's just scale it i can do it here okay let's do a uv texture again it's not going to be accurate but we can use the scale. Ah, never mind. Just nope, no idea what's happening. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Texture. Let's try UV project. Okay, let's see. This one allows us to do. Yep, this works better. And let's slide it. All right, I think this looks pretty cool. Thank you guys for watching. Sorry it took longer than expected. I'm doing it live, so uh, sorry about that. I hope you learned something new. So one more effect that we could explore is dissolving the paper into ashes right after it burns. So there's nothing left and I'm going to show how to uh, implement that. And we can easily do that by using a color node and remapping the temperature to get the various masks that we need. So let's use a color node and put down, uh, write down temperature. And this is the data that we're going to be deleting. So this is the paper. And as the fire goes through, it's going to delete everything behind it. But we want to isolate an edge that we can use to emit particles to give the illusion that this material is dissipating into ashes and we create a particle sim off of that. So this is to be deleted. The other thing we need is the actual source emission, which we can extract like this. So we can isolate A section and this is going to be the source maybe it's too far yep let's delete everything else okay delete points and here we're going to delete the same thing but not selected Right, so if I, uh, let's, let's put down a color node and just restore the color. So as I play through, the fire is gonna start coming and it's gonna delete what's left behind it. So we see fire, but we need to see the effects of the particles being emitted. And that's what we're gonna use this source for. So I'm gonna scatter points on this I'm going to use a pop network and let's go inside and use uh, all points and give them a short life so one uh, second one fps sorry one t is 24 frames per second which is here so that's one and I'm going to randomize them and let's give them some noise uh, at the beginning. So we're going to move them up 
and variance is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and also some noise to the sides. And let's hit play. And we should see the particles going up. And it's going to uh, give the illusion that the actual particles or the ash are blown up. So I think 5 is too much. Let's try 0 0.1 and variance 0.1 on all of them. And let's use a pop force and add uh, some swirls. So let's add two. Uh, one big and one small. And let's see how that's going to look. Yeah, something like that. I think the noise is too much, but we get the idea. Size 0.5 and 1 and 3. And let's go back and try to do a play blast to show how this is going to look like. Maybe give this a, a red color. orange color and this is the paper and let's visualize the fire as well which is here let me check yeah the fire is here so let me visualize all of this And I'm going to do a play blast and we take a look in the next video at this. I think the particles are too much. So I'm just going to lower it to 500. And let me do a play blast. Again, this is just an illustration how you could do the dissolving effects if you want to explore that. Here is a quick preview of the dissolving uh, effects that we did. There's definitely a lot of work. Uh, that needs to be done but if this is something that you want to pursue this is how you would get started on it the main thing I would change is the uh, delay I would delay the uh, particle dissolving maybe one frame and just move it behind the fire a bit because right now it's overlapping with that we would need more points and we would need to make them ramp up from uh, orange to black and uh, fade them away very quickly so that we don't have any anything left all right, guys, good luck. And we're going to start talking about the rendering uh, side of things now. So let's start building the scene and prepping the rendering side of things. And what I have here is a website called Polyhaven. And uh, if you want to support this, it's a great initiative what they have here. So basically, they are, they are running Patreon and use that money to create more content. So the more money they get, the more contents we get. And everything is, is free. And you can build a very cool scene. You've got tables, you've got this brass vase, and there's a lantern that I used, a clock, a chair, I believe I picked this one. No, nope, I picked a different one, a gothic chair. This is the lantern. So let's, uh, let's use this one. Let's download it. And here inside the edit, I'm going to change it to zip. And what I need is the GL... TF format and we need we can just use a JPEG for all of them and click download and I have the file already extracted in a folder so I'm gonna go here there's no as far as I know there's no current way to do this in SOPS so you have to use the main menu and if we go under the import, you will see this format called uh, Glyph, GLTF. I don't know how you say it, but that's the format. And then I'm going to browse to this lantern and import it. It's very, very cool. So you load in the geometry and it comes with uh, the, uh, the elements. So two uh, geometry nodes and a material. And this is what we need to copy into... Uh, karma. So the way I've been doing it, you can save this out as USD and copy this, but there's a simpler way uh, that we're going to use. I'm going to go to stage and now we're inside 
karma or the stage context and i'm going to create a sub create node call this the lettern metal and i'm going to copy it again and i'm going to call this glass and let's create a material library node and let's go back and copy stuff from here so i'm going to copy what's inside this so this is the I believe the glass let's go inside yep and just i just dove inside that swap create and pasted it this is gonna have the data inside stage for simple assets it works perfectly we don't need to do anything fancier so i'm gonna copy the mesh as well and go to stage and paste it here and let's merge all of this into a scene and let's create a grid and add it to our scene. Cool. And let's connect the material library and we should uh, have two as well. So everything comes pre-built in. So I need these two. And let's go to stage again, dive inside and paste them. And now we need to assign them. So assign material. I'm going to switch to my Solaris uh, UI to show me the Explorer. And under the assign material, I'm going to grab the Latin glass. That's the primitive. And the material is going to be this. And let's do the same thing for the metal. and that's the geometry and this is the shader and the drag and drop is not the best when i'm recording so let's see i can make this smaller okay and the texture is loading already and we are uh, rendering inside of Karma now. So let's create a, a skylight, an environment light. And let's create a merge node and group all of them in case we wanted to add more. And let's put another merge here to connect the scene with the lights. And this is where the merge is going to go. And then we have the lantern imported into stage and working nicely so we have a few more things that we need to set to get the light to propagate through this other than the material and for now i'm just going to create a, a light and i'm going to make it a sphere and make it smaller 0 0.05 even smaller 0 0.005 and you can see uh, we don't see the light itself so we can change that if we go under karma create our set and render geometry light and now we can see it but once i move it inside the object we don't see that anymore so we're going to fix it in the next video to see how to set the object to be invisible and let the light uh, come through and let's reduce the intensity of this light and change its color to have a bluish tint in the center or the lantern light to have orange color and let's increase it to 100. so the lantern is working nicely now and the the only thing left to do is to make the glass invisible or transparent so the first thing that comes to mind is to go to the shader make sure it's transparent which is not the case here so let's increase the transparency to one and it's quite glossy right now blurry and the reason for that is the roughness is too high. So let's set it to 0 0.1. Let's set it to 0. And it's still not coming through. And the reason for that is there's a bump which is not working quite well for the glass. So I'm just going to turn it off. And boom, we got our uh, object. We can increase the roughness of the light and make it glossy as well. And this is going to change... The depth, yeah, it's not going to do anything here. I wanted to make it rougher. 
Let's reduce the metallicness, maybe the reflection. Yeah, we can, we can go above uh, one. So yeah, I wanted to create something like that. It's gonna be noisy, but I think it's gonna look cool. Uh, let's put this back to one and this to one. And the, the, the main thing we need is the light, but it's not coming through right now. What we're seeing here is the reflection and the global illumination of this object being bright and being reflected. What we need to see is the actual shadows coming from the lantern, and that's not happening. Even if I increase this to a thousand, it's not working. So we need to do one more thing. We need to use a, uh, a render geometry setting, and we need to make this object invisible to uh, shadow rays. So under Karma, I'm gonna go render visibility, and there is no option for this here. So we have to do it by hand. I'm gonna type in minus shadow. And once I do that, the light is coming out now. So this object is visible to all rays except the shadow rays. So let's increase the light intensity. And there we go. We have a very cool lantern with a nice uh, glow at the center. do believe that we can still uh, make some other adjustments under opacity and use enable uh, fake caustic to also get the object to be transparent but uh, removing it from the shadow visibility is just more efficient in this case okay so let's bring in our paper i'm going to use a sub create node uh, we've cached out the uh, data to disk i'm going to use a file node and just import that in so this is what we have. And I've cast the color information with the edge as a CD attribute. Okay, so all of this is uh, included in the shader. And we just have to read that, which is which happened by default. So we just have to make sure that that uh, gets plugged in correctly. So let's connect this here. And I want to uh, move, uh, keep the lantern with the light uh, separate so the grid let's move it here and let's create a merge node so in case we wanted to move the lantern we can just include the light with it and for this we're going to call it paper and let's see where it is oh it's too big okay so let's make it smaller Yeah, it's not realistic, but I'm just going to show how everything works. So, and later I will show the final scene with the final uh, layout and everything needed. All right. So we have the paper. We just need to assign the texture to it. Let me move it down a bit. Okay. And let's create a principal shader. I'm going to use a mantra. Uh, sorry, the all shaders. You can use Material X. I haven't explored that yet, but you can explore that. So let's call this paper. And I'm just going to set it to red. Make sure it's working. Okay, let's go up. And under Assign, I'm going to drag the paper. And this should be called paper. Cool. So let's import the uh, load in the texture file. Let me copy it from the original scene. And that should be here. Let's go inside. And I'm going to set this back to uh, gray. And under the base color, I'm just going to paste the texture. And let's set this to one, one, and one. And now we have our texture loading in and it's being multiplied with the, with the color, which is very cool. And I think that's it. That's all I did for the, uh, for the paper. The only other thing 
uh, that I faked is I wanted to give it the illusion that this paper is translucent. So if you look here under the shadow, it's not super dark. So the sh shadow intensity is not too high, which makes it feel as if the light is uh, coming through the paper. And what I did is under opacity, I'm going to turn on opacity. And right now you can see the shadow is gone. This is great for creating bubbles and things like that. And I'm just going to increase the opacity, shadow opacity here. You can see it's much lower now. All right, let's take a look at the final scene and I will go uh, through the fire shader there and the layout and pretty much everything I did. To keep things simple, I've decided to use and create the fire shader again uh, from scratch. So I'm going to use a volume node and I have the path to the VDB files. I'm just going to connect that in and let's use the same uh, transforms that we applied on the, on the paper, on the volume to line them up again. So scale is 0 0.05 and the transform is this. And now we should see the fire. Yeah, I think, I think it is there, but it does not have a shader. So let's connect that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, a starting point and use the billowy smoke shader and call this fire paper. And let's go to the assigned material and let's call the volume fire VDB. Fire VDB. And this is materials and fire paper. Okay, there you go. That's our fire right away. And let's go inside. And because, I mean, there's not so much here uh, to tweak. We, we just need a nice uh, ramp for the fire. So let's reduce the density to zero. I don't need that right now and let's go to the temperature and change this preset to just have orange and let's change this red to be more interesting all right let's increase the intensity to 100 and that's the initial starting point so i'll show how i made a few more tweaks to this uh, inside the shader so let's talk about the scene layout uh, briefly. Uh, I have the paper and that's the main focus here, but I've decided to nicely present it. So I put a table, put this statue here to reflect the illumination of the paper. And then we have a table, we need chairs. So I put two chairs to get more parallax. And I also have a cabinet and the lantern is on top of that, but we don't see it, unfortunately. And I didn't want a super bright source next to the paper because that the fire is gonna be the main illumination source but I kept it anyway. So let me show you the uh, the scene. It's fairly straightforward. And then I will show the fire shader uh, tweaks that I did. And that's it. And the lighting, and then we're gonna talk about some compositing. So this is what we have so far, and this is the important uh, elements that we uh, need to know about. And then everything else is very straightforward. So I went ahead on the Polyhaven website and got the chairs and the table, I believe is from there, maybe from Megascan, it's the same. It's easier to use Polyhaven because it's free. And then the lantern here and the uh, cabinet, cabinet, but it's longer. So I just used half. So the lantern is not too high. And uh, these things are imported the same way. They came in as a glyph a GLTF format. Again, sorry, I don't know how to uh, say that. I don't know how to pronounce it properly. So the wood chair, the bust, this is the the head. I subdivided it to give it more geometry, then used a facet node, make sure we got nice normals. This is the cabinet, and this is the wood chair. 
And again, they just came in with the textures. I plugged them in. I didn't do much there. And then for the statue, same. And all the shaders are here. So there's unused stuff that I'm going to delete. So this is all uh, what came in with the, with the scene. And the only thing that we have to be careful with is the bump, because if we change the size, we have to uh, make sure the bump is working correctly. In some instances, I had to change it to object space. That's the wood chair. This is unused. This is a vase that we don't have. And this is the paper. So uh, very straightforward, not so much there, and the texture. It's exactly what uh, we did. And this is a displacement or a bump from the uh, from Megascan, but we don't have we don't have to use that. All the details are in the geometry. And this is the shader for the uh, for the fire. So this is my ramp. This is the smoke color and this is the density value. And I didn't scale the paper or the volume. I scaled the environment. So the density uh, will affect that but a value of three and 0.5 and the temperature. Now, one more thing I did is inside here, there's a temperature remap. Where is it? There's a temperature min and max to just fit the temperature field better. And I used the value of zero and two. So this is the min and max. And then I plugged that into a ramp, which does not make uh, much of change it's just linear i didn't use it and then the second ramp i believe is not currently used oh the second ramp is to multiply uh, based on the density but it's not doing much because the density is is new anyway so i was taking the density remapping it and use that as a multiplier to make sure that i only have temperature in the where there is a density but i don't think it's needed in this case so that's pretty much it. I started off with the billowy smoke, it's still called that. And that's what I used for this example. All right, now for the, uh, for the uh, render settings, very simple. I set this to 48. I used a touch higher resolution just to get bigger images. And then I, uh, I wrote out multiple AOVs. This is needed for uh, depth of field if we wanted to do that in post and then for the denoise. And I also included uh, the direct indirect uh, diffuse so I can get the fire elimination. I can be able to control the fire elimination uh, in comp. And yeah, the direct and indirect emission, the direct and indirect volume. And I included SSS, but I didn't use it. I just left it there. And that's it for the settings. Everything is uh, exp well explained in the previous videos for the museum and the uh, karma arrow scene. And this is all the shader assignment. So I'll be including everything uh, here, except the assets. I cannot, we cannot share them. So I'll post a link for the Polyhaven geometry, where I got it from for the chair, the bust and the, uh, the cabinet. And the table you can replace from uh, something. I'll provide something as well. So all you have to do is plug in the geometry because again, we can share it, but we will include uh, all of this uh, in the scene. And the the mega scan displacement, it's also we can include that. So I'll include the procedural one, but if you have mega scan account, you can just plug it and create the same, uh, the same one. So for lighting, uh, I kept it very, very simple. And let me switch to Karma. And I'm going to disable uh, three and just leave one light and let me resume the render or restart the render. So for the illumination, we have the lantern, which is at the top left here. And honestly, the main illumination is going to come from the fire. So that's what I was looking for. Uh, but I have the lantern, so that's what the illumination looks like. Let me go back a little bit so we can see it. And I'm going to enable the next light. It's also a spotlight with a bluish tint at the top. 
to get the nice speckler here on the uh, on the table and they are very uh, they're not too strong just lightly visible and another point light here to get some more illumination into the center and then i have a uh, an environment light to illuminate everything using a texture and the texture is from uh, the same website i believe hgr haven and it's called photo studio loft hall uh, underscore 4k so it's just something that ha that is interior it has red uh, lots of red tint and that's it i set uh i set the environment tag the light tags to environment in i believe one two three so that i can control them in comp so this is our render uh, loaded in Nuke, and uh, I've run it through the denoise in Houdini, and this is the final result that we have. I'm pretty happy with it. I'm just gonna show you guys how to uh, combine it again if you wanna make any adjustments. So what, I, what I've done is I've separated AUVs, and because we included them, we can separate them. So I'm gonna put down a shuffle node and I'm going to select, let's say, the environment light. So this is how it would look like. And then we have the lantern light. So we can composite and separate each one of them. And let me take a look. Uh, let me show you what we have here. So this is uh, light two. I'm just going to call it two. I've separated each one of them as well as the fire. So this is one. And this is the lantern. And this is environment. And this is three. I should probably have named them using better name. And this is the fire. We can find this under the emission, direct emission. And then we have the indirect diffuse. We don't need this. It's already included in the render in the other passes. And this is the indirect emission. So this is the illumination from the volume, uh, from the fire itself. Indirect emission. And this is the indirect illumination of the fire onto the volume. So indirect volume. And then we combine all of this. We should have very close or identical render. Yes, identical. Awesome. So now what we can do is if we didn't like any of the lights, sorry, any of the lights, we can just turn them on and off. And this is only the fire illumination by itself. Right, I want to make this uh, more intense. So let me put down the, another merge node and I want all this separate. Actually, these two separate. Plus, I want to combine them with the with the original image, and then I want to add the fire at the end. So plus, and let's move the fire here, and let's just take a look at this without the uh, the other lights or have them here, but reduce their intensity. So let's do one more tweak so that we can do a uh, tweak the entire lights and only focus on the illumination of uh, the fire. So the first thing I want to change or increase is the illumination. I want the, that to be much more visible. And I'm going to desaturate it, change the hue a bit. So hue shift in just a touch and desaturate it a bit because I think it's getting too red. Maybe not desaturated. Yeah, something like that. The fire is very sensitive. Like if we go one one rotation, we uh, we lose the, uh, the, the correct values. And what do we have here? This is the illumination of the volume. So let's see how that's gonna make it look. I think this will give it that glowy look inside and that's just going to make it feel much thicker. I, I don't want that. 
just a touch. And then this is our uh, first fire. So I want to make this more interesting. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to desaturate it completely and uh, increase the contrast and lower the gain and basically separate the brightest area and I'm going to multiply them with a different color like that just to get this bright spot and I'm going to merge it back in So this is the original, and this is after the tweaks. You were getting these nice spots. And I'm also going to do one more tweak. Uh, let's do the same. So instead of going, yeah, instead of going all the way down, I just want to get another tone. And I'm going to make it warmer like that. And let's combine this. So this is the original and this is after tweak. And I'm going to increase the gamma here and reduce the intensity just to give it more contrast. So basically we made the bright brighter, the mid wider and the, uh, the, the low intensity uh, stuff we killed it or reduced that so we have more contrast in the overall and we get in the overall image and we get these nice highlights i'm just going to add that here and let's hit play yeah the fire feels much more intense now and i think with the everything darker it feels it looks cooler honestly with just the illumination of this all right so now I can bring back the entire environment. Yeah, I think it's too bright. So I definitely want to balance it. And let's see which one is causing this one. The environment is too strong. I'm going to reduce that. The Latin is also too strong. And this one, uh, this one I'm going to Tint it more with blue. I'm going to create more contrast in the image. And let's see. Yeah, this one is too red. So hue shift. I'm going to desaturate this one. All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I'm going to create a vignette. And this is just going to add a gradient. Um, it's a, uh, it's a gizmo you can find from Wikipedia. See, I'm adding darker edges. And I think the fire is too uh, yellow. So I'm just going to use a hue shift node and just move this a touch. And I think that's pretty much it for the comp. Uh, the final result has some more uh, lifting, like I'm lifting the blacks a bit more just to make it feel more cinematic. But overall, this is the important bits uh, on how to tweak this if you want to make any adjustment in comps. All right, so let's recap everything uh, we talked about and what we covered today. And this is the final result that we uh, created together. And this is the result that I composited myself. I have some lens flare and I just lifted the black a touch. So it feels it has this a warm red tint, but overall it's very, uh, very close. Now uh, we talked about using textures to create the paper. We talked about creating it procedurally. We used the sop solver to create this uh, interesting uh, warp and distortion effect. We talked about using the spread source to mask uh, the ashed version and the noise dub paper versus the original. Uh, there's also cool, um, cool details here that are happening just by chance. See this warping, this pushing here feels like the paper is melting and, and creating this edge. Honestly, it's luck. And also the end, see this 
a white edge. It feels very natural, like the fire didn't finish that. Uh, so all this, I I didn't plan for it specifically to happen, but I think it happened. Houdini, it's very cool. And uh, we talked about using the spread to emit fire. The fire simulation was very, very simple. And uh, the underneath smoke, I don't think it's visible here. Yeah, it is visible. You can see it there, but it's not very visible. I, I don't think anybody noticed that. There's also some here. So basically what I did is instead of emitting up, I emitted down and I used a flat plane to collide with it. And instead of using, you know, temperature going up, you just use temperature going down. But yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So how can you take this further? Well, the uh, the next thing would the uh, cool that we can add is to have the shader actually change the specular uh, roughness or even remove that completely based on the temperature. So we have a nice mask called temperature and we can use that to drive values in the shader. So uh, if it's white, then we don't need roughness. If it's uh, black, then we need roughness or we need specular. So that's something we can add. Uh, maybe we'll explore that in the next uh, tutorial to read custom attributes and drive shader. Uh, the other thing we can add is to have this paper actually dissolve, but not entirely dissolve, just fall in ashes. And that's going to be much more complicated, but maybe something that you guys uh, can explore. And I think that's pretty much it. Hope you learned something and we'll see you soon in the next video. Bye-bye.